Good evening. Um, well, it's very exciting to be here tonight at the beginning of a year when we, we will be able to rejoice in several events in which Australia single-handedly won World War I, and one of them happens to be the Battle of Beersheba, which we will be hearing about tonight. Um, as you know, tonight's lecture is uh, part of our, I think it's part of our war study series, is that correct? And it's called The Battle of Beersheba, Myths and History 100 Years On. And we could hardly have um, a, a more distinguished scholar on this topic than my colleague, Dr. Jean Bou, who is a senior lecturer here in the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre at the ANU, where his teaching duties include lecturing at the Australian Defence Forces Command and Staff College. But Jean, as many of you will know, is a very widely published author in Australian military history, author, co-author and editor of some 10 books. Um, and I won't list them all this evening, but the most important, I think, for this evening's um, presentation are his history of light horse, history of Australia's mounted arm. He's also recently published, uh, together with Peter Dennis, one of the volumes in uh, the his centenary history of Australia in the Great War, the AIFM Battle, and he's currently working, or has just completed volume four of the official history of Australian peacekeeping, humanitarian and post-Cold War operations called the limits of peacekeeping. But I know we're going to hear tonight about his uh, many years of research on the light horse in the, in the campaign in Palestine, and particularly the Battle of Beersheba. Uh, thank you very much, Joan, for that, and uh, thank you all for coming along to listen to me talk tonight. Uh, what I'm going to do is, I'm a little bit tied to the lectern because of the recordings. I do norm to, I prefer to pace around a little bit, but uh, so having been stuck to the lectern, I'm going to start with a few quotes uh, that perhaps might set the tone for uh, what you've already heard about in the last day or so as we lead up to the centenary tomorrow, and probably here for the next couple of days as we wind down. Uh, until such time as the uh, centenary of Bathsheba becomes, as they say, fish wrapping. So, what did Jonathan King have to say about Bathsheba? I think the Battle of Bathsheba should be the cornerstone of our Australian identity, replacing Gallipoli. Gallipoli was a British-led defeat. Bathsheba was an Australian-led victory. Anthony Pratt of the Pratt Foundation and also cardboard mogul in the Weekend Australian Bathsheba Liftout magazine on the weekend, in which I had an article. The shock and awe victory changed the course of Middle East history and paved the way for Israel's establishment some three decades later. Paul Daly, journalist and author, in his book Bathsheba, A Journey Through Australia's Forgotten War of 2009, wrote, there is perhaps no more salient military metaphor than Bathsheba when it comes to Australian doggedness, perseverance and courage in the face of adversity. It was also the turning point in the British campaign against the Turks. Uh, these ones are at least literate and legible, as opposed to the Canberra Times headline today, which, which said, Anzac Light Regiment Cavalry Charge at Bathsheba Poised for Reenactment. <laughs> Clearly, uh, sub-editors are no longer employed at the Canberra Times. So what we have there is a pretty good sampling, I think, of some of the stuff that we hear about Bathsheba, and whenever it comes up, uh, it is the sort of things that we tend to hear. And as I said, I think there's going to be a lot of it in the next 24 to 48 hours. Uh, so with that sort of as the backdrop, uh, I think it's uh, fairly safe to say uh, that Bathsheba is pretty famous as far as battles go. <laughs> Uh, writing for the wartime, the War Memorial magazine, uh, an edition that came out just a few weeks ago, uh, I posited, partly as a, I admit as a hook for the article, but I did wonder whether actually Beersheba is the most, second most famous battle in Australian military history. Uh, there'd be lots of contenders for that, and anyone in here who's a Second World War historian might uh, take, Matt, take issue with that. Perhaps it's L. Main, perhaps it's Kokoda. But Bathsheba is very much alone in being the only Australian battle to have been recreated twice for Australian feature films. Uh, and I think it's this which has actually done a lot to make the Battle of Bathsheba as famous as it is, uh, because it is nicely reducible to a simple and exciting story, 
convert that into a movie and that lodges in the public memory in a way that perhaps no other battle really can, uh, uh, with the exception, of course, in Australia of Gallipoli, which will, I think, always remain at the top of the pile, if you like. Uh, so, and that fame has some consequences. Uh, in the first instance, it really reduces the Australian experience of the campaign in Palestine, basically to the Battle of Bathsheba itself. Uh, and indeed, when it comes to the battle, the real thing that most people are interested in is the charge. So the 15 to 20 minutes at the end of the day in which two regiments crossed uh, all that ground to get into the southeast of, of town itself. Uh, it's a very reductionist issue, uh, a very reductionist way of approaching the battle, but I think uh, that's the way it is. Uh, and also, Bathsheba has plenty of myths. Uh, some of them are old and some of them are more recent. I think you've probably all heard the claim that it's the last great cavalry charge in history. Uh, that's one that will, gets a lot of airtime, and we'll get some more in the next couple of days, already has. The other, the, the alternative, uh, it's a turning point in the campaign, which Paul Daly, uh, the quote from Paul Daly, highlights. Uh, there's a whole bunch of lower level myths about what actually happened in the battle itself. I generally won't go into those tonight because it's getting down into the weeds a little bit. Uh, of course, there's the so-called famous photograph, uh, which is purported to be a photograph of the charge. I'll come back to that a little bit later on. Uh, and what, one of the more newer ones, and one that's gaining a lot more traction, I think, is that Bathsheba is somehow linked to the creation of the State of Israel, uh, which I think has some interesting things to say about uh, Australian politics uh, and international relations with the Middle East. So tonight my purpose is to revisit the battle uh, and in doing so I'm going to provide, attempt to provide some context for the battle to give a better understanding of where it sits in the broader scheme. I'm going to examine the battle itself uh, mostly so as to think about what happened uh, and to hopefully make it a little bit more than just a recounting of the charge. And to conclude, I'm going to have a look at a few of those myths uh, and I'll be up front, I'm going to do a little bit of myth busting as part of that. <coughs> okay, so the first part of the context is just absolutely bearing in mind that this period is a global war. It is the Great War, the First World War. Uh, this is a war which claimed millions of lives. Uh, it is a global war between empires and several of those empires will disappear at the end of the war. It, it re genuinely is an epochal event. What happens in Palestine is, to a large extent, something of a sideshow in the context of the First World War. It is called a sideshow by many of the participants during the war, but that's really only the case for the main combatants. Uh, for some of the minor players, that's particularly the people who live in the Middle East, uh, much bigger things were at stake. Uh, but from the British view, uh, indeed from the French view, and the French view is more important and we tend to give it credence for these days, and from the Ottoman point of view, uh, what is happening in Palestine is a sideshow. Uh, it's understandable for Britain because of what's going on on the Western Front, and indeed uh, it is certainly more understandable for the French, given what's going on on the Western Front. It is somewhat more perplexing for the Ottomans, uh, given that a lot of the fighting is taking place on Ottoman territory. But nevertheless, during the war, uh, what happens in Palestine and also Mesopotamia seems to be a somewhat lower priority for them than what's going on in other parts of the war, particularly in the Caucasus. Now, that's not to say this campaign is not important. I think it is important for several reasons. It has a profound effect on the history of the Middle East, uh, though whether I'd draw any links to the creation of Israel, I'm not quite so sure. Uh, and if you're interested in warfare, I think uh, there's a lot to be said for getting away from the Western Front, particularly in the latter parts of the war. Because in Australia, we will focus on Gallipoli a lot at the beginning of the war, and then once we hit 1916, it's all about the Western Front. And this is very much the case in a lot of Anglophone history, uh, and I dare say Francophone as well. Uh, but, of course, what happens on the Western Front is not the be-all and end-all of the war. As the map up there signifies, and all those red circles indicate, indicate somewhere on the globe where a land campaign, some of them brief, some of them long, was fought. So all the way from the Pacific, including 
Australia taking Rabaul and New Zealanders taking Samoa, all the way up to the Western Front on the North Sea and are lots of places in between, down in Africa, up in China as well. The green squares uh, represent places where there were significant rebellions during the war, at least against the British and the French, and of course the top one is for Ireland, and the bottom one is for uh, one of the periodic rebellions that occurred in Algeria during the war. Uh, so the war is, just, is more than just the Western Front. And I, so for that reason, I think examining what goes on in Palestine is useful for under, understanding warfare in its broader sense in the early part of the 20th century. The other thing to bear in mind is that this is very much a clash of empires. Um, to a certain extent, it is what's going on in Palestine is simply about taking the war to your enemy, in this case the British and French empires, taking it to the Ottoman, their enemy, the Ottoman Empire. Um, but in many ways, this is a campaign which imperial ambitions are very much at the heart of what's going on. Uh, now, I'm not going to sit up here and bang on about the evils of British, French, Ottoman or anybody, anybody else's imperialism, although well, evils there undoubtedly were, but imperialism is simply part and parcel of the imperial or of the world order in the period. Uh, any nation, self-respecting nation state with enough material resources and enough military power is on the imperial make in one way or another. Uh, and in fact, I think it would be easier to write a list of countries that were not than it would be to write a list of countries in the earlier 20th century that were. Uh, of course, the big problem for everybody is that Germany has imperial ambitions, but the problem is that those desires reflect uh, you know, ambitions in Europe. Um, elsewhere, uh, Britain and France and places like Belgium are on the make, expanding their empires in Africa. Middle East, anywhere else the opportunity, opportunity presents itself. Even the supposedly anti-imperialist United States uses, partly uses the war as an excuse to occupy Haiti and the Dominican Republic in the, about not, in the about midway part of the war. Even, and as I've mentioned, even little old Australia seeks to set up its own little empire with an empire by taking New Guinea. So big war uh, blends with sort of imperial ambition and opportunism. Uh, along with a whole bunch of regional enmities and local rivalries to give us a global war. And Palestine reflects this very much. Uh, what's going on in the Middle East is absolutely a reflection of these imperial contests. Uh, on the Western, if we look at on the, the war in Europe and on the Western Front, it's rather easy to put the Germans in some black hats and the French and the British in some white hats and then go off and worry about whatever the problem is because Germany seems to be upsetting the apple cart. But if you go to the Middle East, everybody's hat is a shade of grey. There are no out-and-out -out good guys and there are no out-and-out -out bad guys either. Uh, and in that vein, everybody, with probably the exception of the United States, is involved in the Middle East campaigns in one way or another. Germany, Britain, France, Italy, the Ottoman Empire, uh, the Austrians, everybody is taking part in this campaign. Uh, it's also just bear, worth bearing in mind um, that it's not just MP, um, contests between the two opponents in the war, there are also issues between allies. No doubt the Ottomans and the Germans had their own issues, um, and they certainly had plenty of them, but even if you just look at the French and the British, um, they are trying to manage an alliance relationship in the Middle East. Uh, Britain and France might be age-old enemies, but they haven't actually gone to war for, this stage, about 100 years. And they've come close once or twice, uh, but for the last 50 or so years in the lead up to the war in particular, the French and the British have done a very good job of dividing the world up between themselves and coming to a series of agreements about how to manage the world and how to become, respectively, the first and second largest imperial powers in the world. And in the context of 1917 and what's going on in Palestine, when it comes to the Sykes-Picot Agreement of May, May 1916, and indeed uh, the Balfour Declaration of November 1917, uh, to a large part, these are agreements that have been forged with an eye to maintaining and delineating the relationship between Britain and France. <coughs> 
Okay, so having set out a little bit of context, uh, I'm, uh, at the higher levels, if you like, I'm going to drop down to the campaign level uh, and set up what's going on at Beersheba in 1917. Very briefly, uh, the lead up begins in 1916 with the opening of uh, what we know as collectively as the Sinai Palestine campaign of 1916 to 1918. And this begins essentially as a British project to defend the Suez Canal, which of course is a great lifeline to the British Empire, uh, but also the British holding of Egypt, which of course is a British protectorate, even though technically it remains <coughs> part of the Ottoman Empire. Initially, uh, this is to defend the canal close to the canal itself, around about there. But very quickly, the British figure out this is not very viable. It's a difficult place to maintain defensives, uh, defences, so they're going to push out into the eastern Sinai to develop a defensive position on much firmer ground out here around about El Arish. Uh, the Ottomans, of course, have their own ambitions and they push a force across uh, the Sinai in early, late July, early August, which leads to the Battle of Romani here right in the Western Sinai. Uh, this is the high point of Ottoman expansion during the war. I'll come back to this a little bit later, but from this point onwards, uh, the Ottoman Empire is on the defensive in this theatre. All right, this is followed up by battle, by uh, further action. The, the advance across the Sinai for the British is basically dictated by the rate at which they can build a railway and a water pipeline, because you can't survive out there without the water. So as they're building it across, the British move across, uh, the mounted troops in particular are doing a lot of patrolling and minor actions. Uh, and eventually in December, uh, they've got as far as they can launch themselves at El Arish, which is, if you recall, is their ultimate objective. Uh, they pounce on El Arish to find the enemy have disappeared. Uh, so they immediately move on to Magdaba, which is just up the wadi. There's a big wadi there between El Arish and Magdaba. They uh, defeat an Ottoman garrison there in December. And then in January, they move on to take another Ottoman outpost here at Rafa on the frontier between Egypt and Palestine. Now right about here is where the imperial ambition, from the British point of view anyway, starts to become more apparent. Up until now it has been essentially conceived of as a defensive operation. But having secured the, the, the part of the Eastern Sinai that they'd been aiming at, uh, now they start to creep into advancing into Palestine. Uh, it's actually quite difficult to discern the moment when any decision about this is taken. It's almost taken instinctively. Uh, Britain became an imperial power by thinking imperially. Uh, the essence of empire is opportunism uh, and Britain was going to take the opportunity. So without much ado, the campaign shifts into a, an offensive one. Uh, part of this is also a tactical issue about this is a chasing ground. Having taken Rafa, they decide it's not that very easy to secure, uh, and perhaps pushing northwards to Gaza seems like a, a good idea. It might be a better defensive position. This is a problem that comes out in the Middle East from time to time. Similar sorts of things happened in Mesopotamia as well, which partly leads to the uh, disaster at Kut in early 1916. So having made the decision to continue the advance into Palestine, what happens is the first Battle of Gaza in March 1917. Uh, I won't go into too much details, but it's, uh, suffice to say it's essentially a British defeat. The British had actually pretty much won the battle, but they didn't know it. And at the end of the day, partly due to concerns with water uh, and anxieties that a Ottoman relief force is on the horizon, uh, the British <coughs> opt to withdraw at the end of the day. Supposedly the garrison, the Ottoman garrison commander was so amused he literally fell around laughing. He couldn't believe the British had walked away. Uh, so the British fluff first Gaza. Which leads to the second Battle of Gaza uh, just a few weeks later on the 19th of April. Now the intervening weeks the Ottomans use with great industry. Uh, they basically evacuate the population of Gaza, such as it is. They then go tear Gaza apart to get out every little bit of construction material they can find. Uh, they manage to chase up some barbed wire, 
The Ottomans are always a bit shelled of barbed wire, but they manage to find some fairly large quantities. And they basically convert Gaza, which had essentially been an a undefended township, uh, into what was described at the time as a modern fortress. They dig entrenchments, build redoubts, set up fields of barbed wire, do the fire planning and make it into a very difficult nut to crack. As part of that, they also extend the defensive line out to the southeast, out towards Beersheba. So the British uh, have another go at, Ape, at Gaza, uh, and this uh, is safe to say is a disaster. Uh, the British do not even come close to taking Gaza. Uh, the casualties are very high. Casualties for the day are in the around about six and a half thousand British troops, which would make it the most costly battle of this campaign completely. Uh, and even by Western Front standards would be a pretty bad day at work. Uh, Australians are somewhat lucky in that a lot of them are actually involved in the flank, securing the flank operations down here to the south, uh, although the recently created Australian Mounted Division uh, is involved on some of the assaults here, and they have a fairly hard day at work as well. So at this point, uh, the British have been well and truly checked in southern Palestine. Uh, and there's no immediate chance that they're going to be able to reverse it. Uh, the commander of the Egyptian Expeditionary Force, a chap called Sir Archibald Murray, uh, he's spun what's happened at Gaza. The British War Office uh, has figured out that he, they, they, he's spun them a bit of a line, and they haven't been very happy with him anyway, so they take the opportunity to replace him, and the chap they send out to replace him is General Sir Edmund Allenby. Until very recently, he's been commanding uh, an army on the Western Front. Uh, like many British officers of the Second World War, he's been fairly rapidly promoted up to army command. He starts the war as the commander of the cavalry division during the retreat from Mons. Uh, Alan B. C. takes this as actually a, a signal of personal failure. He is, uh, he's not the first choice. Jan Smuts is the first choice, but he doesn't take the job. Uh, the British government is casting around who's going to go, we're going to send out to the Middle East. Allenby's name comes up, and Douglas Haig and Allenby didn't, they weren't enemies, but they didn't get on particularly well. Uh, they'd actually been to staff college together. Uh, and when Allenby's name comes up, Haig makes no effort to keep him and signals that he's willing to let Allenby go. So Allenby's recalled to London, uh, and he's been the senior commander for the recent Battle of Arras, uh, or Arras which, like most Western Front battles of the period, goes well at the beginning and then bogs down. So he thinks this is a, a sign of his failure. But uh, you have to give Allenby his due. He goes out to the Middle East and he kind of... I actually get the impression mostly he just relaxed. Uh, and he'll do well in Palestine. Uh, by the end of the war, he'll have be the, the victor of the campaign. He'll be a field marshal and it won't be that long before he'll be Viscount Allenby. So he's going to do quite well out of this. Uh, and he'll deserve those accolades too by the, by the time it comes around. Uh, when he goes out there, he's, uh, however, greeted by the, the grim personal news that his only child, uh, Michael, has just been killed serving as the artillery subaltern on the Western Front. Uh, interestingly, I read an article about Allenby in the interwar period uh, just recently. And in the interwar period, he actually gets interested in pacifist causes. Wouldn't call him, him personally a pacifist but he certainly supports pacifist causes in the, in the interwar period, uh, and this article suggested that it was due to the death of his son on the Western Front in 1917. All right, so Allenby, the thing that really comes with Allenby is firstly a direction from the British government that they'd really like him to capture Jerusalem, uh, but more importantly is resources. Uh, Murray has had to fight this campaign on a shoestring, uh, and he has had very few resources uh, either physical or in terms of troops, and that reverses for Allenby. Now, Allenby is never going to be absolutely swimming in th the things that he wants, but the War Office is going to give him enough to work with, and that's going to make a significant alteration to the way the campaign pans out. He will now have enough troops to constitute a reasonably balanced force. They'll send him some heavy artillery, they'll send him some of the new latest aircraft so that he will actually start to gain air superiority, which up until now in this theatre had been held by the Germans. And uh, Allenby's going to have a much easier time in that regard. Now underneath, Allenby also as part of this recasts uh, 
Egyptian expeditionary force. Up until now, it's largely been really just an ad hoc colonial expeditionary force. But he rebuilds it into this, which is a modern combined all arms army. He's got two infantry corps and he's got enough cavalry to constitute a full cavalry corps, which of course is led by Harry Chevelle, the first Australian to become a Lieutenant General and to command a corps, beating Monash that by nearly a year. Uh, Chetwood commands 20 corps. Philip Chetwood is a very accomplished and capable, competent officer. In the interwar period, he'll become Field Marshal Baron Chetwood uh, and Commander in Chief of the Indian Army. Uh, Bullfin, I must admit, I don't know that much about, uh, but he certainly does reasonably well in Palestine. Now, he can draw on, when Allenby arrives, uh, he's got to come up with some sort of plan about how they're going to get this campaign restarted. And in doing that, he can draw on an appreciation done by Chetwood uh, around about mid-year, not long before Allenby arrives in the Middle East. And this is known as the Chetwood Appreciation, and it forms the basis of what's going to happen in the second half of the year. Uh, now, Chetwood had very much come to the conclusion that going against Gaza again wasn't very sensible. The EEF's been beaten there twice, Going up there and maybe losing again would be a devastating blow to morale uh, and everyone's going to look a little bit foolish if they get beaten at Gaza again. So he, uh, in his appreciation, sets out a plan for attacking the line further to the southeast and in attempting to break through the line uh, and then get in behind Gaza. Now when Allenby arrives, he reads the appreciation. Uh, he'll modify the scheme a little bit, but in essence he adopts what Chetwood is talking about. So what's going to become the Third Battle of Gaza, or the Ga Third Battle of Gaza slash Beersheba, which the Battle of Beersheba is part of, uh, the idea is that rather than going headlong and bashing your head against Gaza again, the idea is going to be to break in up the far southern flank of the Ottoman position, having broken through there, drive up to the north and the west, hopefully getting behind Gaza, and the idea is that they trap the large Ottoman garrison at Gaza there, encircle it, force it to surrender or pound it into non-existence. So that's the basic scheme of what Beersheba is about. Beersheba becomes the preliminary operation because that's the chosen target to break through and why it's chosen target is the water wells. Because in order to drive up this way, they need access to water. Water dominates all logistical concerns in the Middle East, and Beersheba is a place where there is thought to be substantial water supply. Uh, and indeed, Beersheba is supposedly famous for all the wells that are there. Uh, the plans requires a little bit of engineering work, uh, because it requires a lot of operation out here and then driving in on Beersheba. They need to find water sources out here, but uh, they managed to find some water sources, send some field engineers down there and start developing those. And once that has been developed, they are now have the logistic underpinnings to be able to make the attack on Beersheba itself. So on around about the 27th of October, uh, the British artillery opens up in front of Gaza, essentially as a deceptive measure, and the troops that are uh, earmarked to go to Beersheba uh, make march off into the desert, as it were, to make the attack on the town. And they're moving into position on the 29th, uh, the 30th, uh, and including on the night of the 30th through to the 31st when the battle will actually be fought. So on the morning of the 31st of October, uh, the battle commences with an infantry attack to the west. Uh, of course, in Australia, it's all about the light horse, it's all about the, the charge by the 4th and 12th. Well, this is a two-core operation. The Desert Mounted Corps is going to constitute the mounted troops, but also involved is Chetwood's 20 Corps. And 20 Corps has starts the day with an attack on the fixed defences to the southwest of town. Uh, the attack begins around about dawn, when the artillery opens up, on an Ottoman outpost line. Uh, Ottoman counter-battery fire is not long in coming. Most of it actually doesn't hit the British artillery. What it does tend to hit is the British infantry, who unfortunately are sitting there and they're forming up places, waiting for somebody to blow the whistle. So British infantry start taking casualties pretty much 
first thing in the morning. Uh, the infantry move off around about 8.30 in the morning, capture the outpost line, uh, then things then pause for a little bit while the artillery is leapfrogged forward and another artillery barrage commences around about 10.30, 11 o'clock in the morning. That goes on for a couple of hours. They have to pause the barrage every so often because it kicks up so much, so much dust they can't actually see what they're shooting at, so they have to stop every now and then, wait for the dust to settle a little bit, see what the effect of the fire has been, and then re-engage. Uh, of course, their main objectives are, apart from destroying Ottoman positions, is to cut the barbed wire, because there is barbed wire out in this part of the position. Uh, once the, uh, that fire program's finished, the infantry go forward again, and there's some pretty stiff fighting. Uh, you know, the uh, casualties, British infantry casualties here for the day are about 1,200 troops. And one British soldier from the Royal Welsh Fusiliers will win a Victoria Cross. So this is uh, not a cakewalk by any means. Uh, and the casualty figure is one that's uh, perennially forgotten in Australia, uh, often in our headlong rush to, to note how light the casualties were in the charge on Bathsheba in the 4th Brigade, 4th Light Horse Brigade. Now, the infantry have actually taken their objectives by pretty much early in the afternoon. Uh, and at that point, they could probably have continued onwards. But their orders were actually to stop. Because in the greater scheme of the Third Battle of Gaza, Allenby is anticipating heavy fighting north of Beersheba. And he wants his infantry fresh for that fighting. So the infantry take their objectives and basically sit tight, even though they probably could have continued on with the advance into Beersheba itself because they're, they're act, they're, the door to them is essentially open. OK, so for the mounted troops and, and to the battle to the east of Beersheba. As uh, the British infantry, obviously, are, are making the attack on the west, during the night, the preceding night, the Desert Mounted Corps, not complete, some of the yeomanry are detached to, to cover gaps and things like that, make a big, long approach march right down around the south and come in on the eastern side of Beersheba. Uh, their two main objectives to begin with are two hills. The first one is, on this map, it's Bir el -Sakhti. It's I've seen it spelt and pronounced various ways. Sometimes it's Tel el Sakhti, sometimes it's Tel Sakhti, sometimes it's Bir el Sakhti. Just call it Sakhti, I guess. Uh, this has to be taken because it's a way to cut the Bathsheba Hebron Road here. Uh, that'll act as a cut-off for the troops of the garrison that are in Bathsheba, and it will also act as a way to forestall any other Ottoman reinforcements that come, might come down the road uh, from the north. Uh, so the second Light Horse Brigade is sent up to Tel el -Sakhti. That's basically the first action of the morning, uh, and they're very quickly in the thick of it. They eventually get themselves onto the tell, or the hill. Uh, tell is a, a word meaning hill, but it also traditionally implies the hill is defensible. So if you go to Israel or, and you see a tell something or other, somewhere in its history, it has been a defended hill. And of course, in the Middle East, that history can be a very long one. Anyway, so they get on to Tel El-Sakhti and they manage to cut the road. They also manage to bag an Ottoman convoy in the process. But thereupon, they're kind of stuck there. Uh, they're under clear observation and fire from the enemy. Uh, and the mental image you can have of the, of the light horse guys on that hill is pretty much lying there, getting shot at most of the day, wishing the hole they were in was just that little bit bigger and a little bit deeper. Uh, but nonetheless, they have done the job. <coughs> now, the bigger nut to crack is Tel El Saba which, as you can see there, is at the confluence of a wadi directly to the east of the town. Uh, this, that's Tel El Saba there. Uh, if you've ever been to Beersheba, Beersheba to the south and, and to the east is as flat as a tack. This large hill dominates the area around it and it dominates the eastern approaches to the town. Uh, you are not going to be doing anything to the east of Beersheba from a military point of view unless you take that. So it, taking Tel El Saba is really important. 
Uh, and in fact, you can, that's the tell. I, I don't, with this photo, it's impossible to tell if it was taken from the north or from the south. I think it was taken from the south, but either way, you can see the wadi in front of it. You can see the remains of some of the Ottoman trenches up there. This is ta obviously taken after the battle. This is a photo taken on top of the tell, looking towards south, to the south. You can see the Ottoman trenches there, and you can see the view over the ground to the south. That is where the charge took place. The charge basically went across there. So anybody who's out there, and if the Ottomans control that hill, they're going to have a very difficult day. Uh, they are going to be under observation and fire from the tell, and of course, uh, any artillery that the, anybody on the tell can control. So the job, but the tell is not that big. It's quite a, it's quite a tall mound, but in terms of the hill itself, it's not that big. And the guys that get the job of taking it is the New Zealand Mounted Rifles Brigade. So the New Zealanders go against it around about mid-morning. Uh, and then what begins is a fairly difficult long day in front of the tell. Uh, the problem that the New Zealanders have... Am I going for time? OK. The problem that the New Zealanders have at Tel El Saba is a, a problem that had also been evident at a couple of places across the Sinai. That is, if you're sending mounted troops against prepared defensive positions, uh, they have a decided lack of manpower and firepower. Despite the fact everybody loves to describe the light horse as mounted infantry, they are not mounted infantry. Uh, technically, their term is mounted rifles, and I know that sounds similar, but it's not the same thing. They have a different military role. They are a form of cavalry. Their organisation is a cavalry organisation. They do not have heavy firepower. The most support they've got is their medium machine guns, that is their Vickers guns, and their attached batteries of Royal Horse Artillery, which are small guns by this stage of the war, 13-pounders, not the 18-pounders that everybody knows from the Western Front. Uh, if you send them against a defensive position like that, they have, just have difficulty generating enough firepower to be able to reduce it. And this becomes apparent at Tel El Saba. It will come up again in the, pan in the campaign. I think success tended to mask the problem some, a little bit. And there was a, they never really quite learned the lesson as hard as they should have. So if you can't generate the firepower, they have to do what the mounted troops have done at places like Magdaba and Rafa. And that's essentially edge your way forward by short bounds and rushes, presumably some of which is on, on stomachs, uh, and until you can get close enough to affect uh, enough local fire superiority that you can rush it. Uh, but at Tel El Saba, this proves a, a fairly difficult thing. And time now is starting to creep on. It's getting into the early afternoon. And the town has to be taken that day to keep the timetable and the grander plan for the Third Battle of Gaza uh, on schedule. So Harry Chevelle, who's overseeing what's going on here, uh, sends support. Uh, more like some light horse brigade, the second and third, uh, well, part of the remainder of the second light horse brigade uh, and the third light horse brigade are thrown in to help the New Zealanders. And they fundamentally have the same problem, but now you've just got that many more people sitting there shooting at the hill. Uh, the artillery, the Royal Horse Artillery batteries, there's a couple of batteries in action here. Um, they're starting to affect a little bit more fire superiority. But a 13-pounder just simply can't blast the enemy out of their trenches. It's really just a case of keeping the enemy's head down uh, to such a point that you can creep, as I said, creep forward and launch a final assault. Uh, around about mid-afternoon, that finally happens. The New Zealanders get close enough that they're able to get up, blow the whistle, and effect an assault on the hill. Uh, and the hill finally falls at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Which is great. Uh, the, they, they now, the road to Beersheba is now open, but the problem is the clock has been ticking, and as I said, the town has to be taken at the end of the, by the end of the day. Now, there's disputes about who did what and who was thinking what at what time. I won't go into them uh, too much, but basically Chevelle makes the decision that a mounted attack is the best way to, get, to, nut, to crack the nut, to finish the day off. Now, who was behind the suggestion? A lot of people have claimed some, want some, uh, some role in it. Uh, the commander of the 4th Brigade, Grant, uh, was one person who claimed it was his, his idea. Uh, I don't know that Chevelle actually ever claimed it specifically is his idea. I suspect the main uh, 
instigator of it. He's the commander of the Australian Mounted Division, uh, a British officer by the name of Henry Hodgson. He's a British regular cavalry officer, uh, and he's been a proponent of mounted attack while he's been in the Middle East. Now, at this point, it might be just worth taking diverging a little bit to to knock my first myth on the head, uh, and that's the idea that this is somehow a, a wild, impromptu decision uh, that you know reflects Australia's wild colonial boy heritage kind of stuff. You know, only wacky Australians would dare to do anything quite so crazy. Uh, that's just utter nonsense, I'm afraid. Uh, mounted attacks have been undertaken in this campaign already. Mounted or mounted actions of various kinds. Australians have actually tried it once or twice. At, at, it was one attempt at Katia. Uh, which was a battle subsequent to Romani in 1916. There were uh, mounted attacks, two mounted attacks undertaken by Australian Light Horse uh, units at the Battle of Magdaba, one by the 10th Light Horse Regiment, another by the 2nd Light Horse Regiment, and there are also mounted movements under fire at the Battle of Rafa. So the idea has been floating around in the campaign that actually mounted troops, even in the First World War, in this campaign, can pull off mounted stuff. Hodgson has actually been pushing for his light horse regiments, so he's commanding the, uh, the third and fourth light horse brigades in his uh, division, to actually be equipped with swords so that they can sort of make that final leap to becoming full, full sword carrying cavalry. Now, Chevelle knocks him back uh, for reasons that aren't entirely clear, but obviously this is not traditionally part of the light horse setup, and I think that was essentially it was a conservative reaction. Uh, but in the days leading up to Beersheba, in fact, on the 27th of October, when the Australian Mounted Division issues its operations order for what's going on at Beersheba, it very explicitly points, sets out the idea that look out for the opportunity to conduct a mounted attack. The ground and the terrain around here is very well suited to it. Be alive to the opportunities. And in that order, it also says bayonets should be held high as to pretend it's a sword. It may not have much actual physical effect, but to an enemy in a defensive position, it's going to look like a sword. And they, the division was ordered to sharpen its bayonets for such an eventuality. So on the afternoon of the 31st, when this idea is being kicked around, uh, this is an idea that has some heritage of at least a few days beforehand. OK, so the job gets given to the 4th Light Horse Brigade. Sorry, I should have skipped forward a little bit. Uh, so we're under the charge now. Um, the orders, the job's given to the 4th Light Horse Brigade, uh, largely because they happen to be the closest unengaged brigade. There is a Yeomanry Brigade not far away, but they're, um, just like, they're going to take just that bit longer to get assembled and move into position. So the 4th is there. Uh, it's only able to assemble two of its uh, regiments. The 3rd Regiment, which is the 11th Light Horse Regiment, uh, is not able to get it. It's a little bit further away, and by this stage the light's going. It's often forgotten how bad the light is when the charge takes place. And the 11th Regiment's War Diary notes that they, one of the reasons why they're not able to assemble is because it's actually getting too dark to pass messages around. So the, light, so the 11th will eventually get itself together and follow the rest of the brigade, but they won't take part in the charge. So we get to the charge itself. Uh, now this is a pretty good, this map has some flaws. There are some very strange maps out there about what happened at the Battle of Beersheba, and indeed some of them are contemporary ones. Some of the contemporary ones don't make much sense at all. I'm not really sure uh, what they were smoking in the headquarters when they put them together, but they are rather strange. This one, the major error in this one is that it puts the, t the 4th Regiment behind the 12th. They actually charge side by side. But in broad terms, the formation, the Ottoman defences, the roads, uh, where, where everybody was and what they were doing is pretty accurate and is a good indication of what happened on the, on the event. OK, so the 4th and 12th line up outside of town. 4th Light Horse Regiment on the right, 12th on the left. Uh, each squadron arrayed behind each other. The formations of the last squadron in each regiment is moot. Different sources say different things. Uh, but nevertheless, of course, as most of the stories you're probably aware, uh, 
Uh, they quickly move to a walk, they move to a canter, and they move to a gallop, and it's on for young and old. Now, as I said, the, uh, the light is pretty bad by this stage. Uh, one of the artillery officers who's observing the hill from uh, a vantage point makes the note, writes after the war, that uh, it's actually so dark that you can see the, the muzzle flashes of the Ottoman guns. So Ottoman artillery and rifle fire, machine gun fire from the Ottoman positions, you can actually see the red muzzle flashes. So that gives you an idea of how dark it's getting. Uh, not long after the charge starts, an Ottoman machine gun opens up on the left flank from this position here. And the Knott's battery of Royal Horse Artillery uh, gallops into action, uh, unlimbers and engages the, the position. They find the, sh they find the range with their second shot, uh, which is partly a demonstration of excellent field gunnery. It's also a demonstration of sheer luck on the battlefield. Because the war diary, the battery, or the battery war diary mentions that it was too dark to use the rangefinder. So it gives you an idea of how dark things are getting. Uh, so they guesstimated the range and managed to get it on their second shot. And then, of course, they're able to fire for effect and silence the machine gun fairly sharply. Uh, now, whilst that's going on, the regiments are, of course, galloping onwards. Uh, I'm sure to be in the front rank was pretty nerve-wracking. Uh, you're looking across essentially a very, very flat piece of ground. Uh, you can see where the enemy is, and given the darkness, you can see their muzzle flashes. Uh, I'm sure there were a few nervous chaps in the front rank. Uh, for the second and third ranks, I don't think they actually probably saw very much. Uh, the amount of dust kicked up was reportedly voluminous. And I suspect the, uh, the second and third ranks probably didn't see much apart from just getting through the dust that enveloped them. The third rank of the 12th Light Horse, which is on this flank, actually doesn't seem to have followed the charge straight on. Uh, they went, they seem to have moved in uh, column along this wadi here, which, which formed the left flank of the charge. Now, the axis of the charge is this road. It's called the W Road. And that's basically the line of advance the whole way. So they gallop onwards and they hit the Ottoman defences. Now, the main thing that really, above all else, I think, that gives you some, gives the, the charge the ability to succeed is there's no barbed wire. Barbed wire is created to stop animals. And throughout the First World War, cavalry action, any form of mounted action in the, in the face of barbed wire just doesn't come off. And it's worth noting, it doesn't come off for the infantry either a lot of the time. That's why the artillery spends so much time trying to cut the wire. But they know that the, wire, the ground in front of uh, these positions is not wired, and they know that from aerial reconnaissance undertaken before the battle. Uh, so there's an element of surprise in all this. Uh, and the lack of barbed wire is also a very significant action. And indeed, one of the regimental commanders says afterwards that you know, if it wasn't for the wire, we just wouldn't, lack of wire, we wouldn't have got anywhere. Uh, the first squadrons hit the enemy positions. They start dismounting. There's the famous hand-to-hand -hand fighting that everybody talks about. And of course, they move on into town and they take the town itself. Uh, and luckily, uh, they also managed to seize most of the wells, although one or two are blown up. Now, the charge is not all that's going on. Chaffel's not an idiot. <laughs> He's doing sensible things. And the charge is part of a general advance. So when the 4th Light, Light Horse Brigade gets sent to do the charge, other people are being moved around as well. So the troops that are up around Tel El Saba and around Tel El Sarkadi are also sent forward. And there's other movements down here. The 7th Mounted Brigade starts coming up from the south. Uh, this is really tightening the, loo the noose at the end of the day. It is not just about the charge. And so what we now get into is the aftermath. Now, of course, the idea had been that they would smash through Beersheba, drive to the north and encircle the enemy. Well, that doesn't really come off. Uh, the whole ch effort tends to dissipate because the Ottomans take up new defensive positions to the north particularly here around Tel El Sharia, and there's another place here called Tel El Kuwaifa. This holds the advance up, and what also proves to be a problem is there's not enough water at Beersheba to support more operations, despite the fact that's what they grabbed it there for. So the mounted troops in particular are really affected by the lack of water, and they spend most of their time looking for water sources uh, when they're not actually fighting somebody. 
So that when the breakthrough actually occurs here at Tel al-Sharia, which is probably, you know, is, is, I have to say in, in border terms, is, is probably more important than the fighting at Beersheba, uh, the mounted troops can't exploit because they are not, no longer collected as a mass and they've been severely affected by the lack of water. Uh, and what happens, of course, is the Ottoman garrison, which had been in Gaza, uh, flies the coop. So the great encirclement never comes off. Nevertheless, Alamy does achieve a great victory in, in some ways because uh, the Ottomans have to begin a headlong retreat northwards. They never lose complete cohesion and they're chased hard all the way. They certainly don't lose, don't win any of the fights against the British in the, in the next little bit. Uh, and eventually things will come to a rest again in central Palestine around about December, uh, not during which uh, the British would also take Jerusalem, uh, hence fulfilling Lloyd George's directive to Allenby when he's sent out there. OK, so I've been banging on for a bit now. And I'm, I'll, I, will, I will start moving on now. So that's the, the battle in itself in a, in a nutshell. What I'll turn on to now is a little bit briefly uh, looking at some of the myths of the Battle of Beersheba. That Beersheba was a turning point in the campaign. Uh, I'm fundamentally sketchy about the notion of turning points in any military campaign. Perhaps in, in, in naval warfare it is more pertinent and more relevant, but I think in land campaigns these are often problematic conceptions. Um, why should Bathsheba be the turning point? Why isn't it when Allenby is appointed? Why isn't it when Allenby is given the resources? Why isn't it when Lord George sits down with Allenby? Uh, it's worth, as I said before, the Ottomans have been on the back foot since the Battle of Romani. You know, if you wanted to pick a, a turning point, surely Romani would be a more sensible turning point than the Battle of Bathsheba. So, and of course, the campaign's been going for more than a year by this stage of the war, and it's still got another year to run. So why you would pluck a Beersheba out as a turning point, I, I'm not entirely sure. An extension of the idea is that uh, the charge, or the battle, won the campaign. Uh, no, I don't think it did. Uh, as I said, this is a three-year campaign. There are lots of things happening at all sorts of times in those three years. Uh, no one battle won the campaign. And as something complex as war, no one event can win a campaign. It is as much about sustainment, a willing to commit resources, good leadership, good command, uh, the work of staff officers, the work of logisticians, uh, the work of trainers creating the force to fight. Uh, the British victory in the Middle East relied on more than just 800 Australians charging in along the W Road on the afternoon of the 31st of October. Moreover, if you take a slightly larger look at the way the war in fact does end in the Middle East, uh, it's not just what's going on in Palestine that affects the Ottoman Empire at the end of 1918. In the, around about the same time as the Battle of Megiddo launches off in mid-September 1918, uh, the British and the French, with their somewhat reluctant Greek allies, will break out of the Salonika Front, uh, which is in northern Greece. As they break out of the Salonika Front, the British will turn right and they will start advancing towards Constantinople. There is no Ottoman army between the British and Constantinople. So as much as the, the Ottoman Empire is facing a grave crisis in Palestine in the aftermath of the Megiddo Offensive in mid-September 1918, uh, they're also facing a very grave crisis <laughs> much closer to home. And it's those twin shocks, and out of the two, I would suggest that Salonika is perhaps the weightier one, which will help drive the Ottoman Empire out of the wall. What also matters is the collapse of Bulgaria, which breaks the land bridge between the Ottoman Empire and the rest of the Central Powers. And of course, by September 1918, the Central Powers position is not looking very good. If you're looking at it from Constantinople, now seems like a good time to get out of the war. It's not just about what's happening in Palestine. I get variations on this one, that it was the last great slash successful slash something else charge in history. Uh, no, it wasn't. I suppose the get out of jail card is the great bit. 
you can say, well, anything's great if you want it to be, you know, so greatness is a subjective assessment. I'm sure there are people who think Kevin Rudd and Tony Abbott were great prime ministers. Uh, I would suggest that perhaps those people would be in the minority. When it comes to this, whether this is a great charge or not, is very much in the eye of the beholder. But in terms of being the last charge in history, not even close. Uh, in this campaign alone, there were more charges than I could list here from memory. Uh, two big ones, or fairly significant ones, occur within several weeks of the charge at Beersheba. At the eighth, on the 8th of November, uh, a relatively small group, mixed group of British Yeomanry, who were part of the 5th Mounted Brigade, which is part of the Australian Mounted Division, mount a successful charge at Hooge. Uh, it's a fairly costly charge out of the troops that take part. About half, nearly half of them become casualties. But that's because they had to charge with no fire support and without having undertaken a reconnaissance. It's a very much an off-the-route-of-march kind of thing. But nevertheless, they take about nine Austrian field guns. That's one of them there. They literally charge, this is kind of almost Napoleonic in conception. You're talking about yeomanry who are equipped with swords, lining up, drawing swords and charging at the guns. But this time they get home and they're literally you know, jabbing at gunners, Austrian gunners, through the wheels of their, their guns as they try to defend the guns. Uh, and indeed, if you're ever in the UK and you feel inclined, you can go visit the Warwickshire Yeomanry Museum and one of those guns is to be found there today. Uh, a few days later, at the 13th, on the 13th of November, uh, there was an even larger charge by the 6th Mounted Brigade at a place called El Mugar. This one, two regiments. It's as large as the charge at Beersheba. This is not a small charge. And in fact, there's another, um, there's more yeomanry involved in dismounted fighting as well. So the whole brigade is involved with it, and two regiments are uh, involved with the charge. And they clear an enemy ridge of position that had been basically holding up the infantry for a better part of the day. Uh, there are more charges in July 1918 uh, around on the, uh, the eastern bank of the Jordan. And if you look at the advance to Damascus in 1918 from uh, following the Battle of Megiddo, there are charges left, right and centre. And indeed, Australian light horse will conduct more charges. So it's certainly not the last... It's not even the last Australian charge in history, let alone the last charge in history. And of course, if you go digging around in some other wars, you'll find other charges as well. And in fact, there's at least one reasonably well-known one by Italian cavalry on the Eastern Front in the Second World War. Uh, and I've read an account of French Spahi doing a small charge in the Algerian War. So there's certainly uh, plenty of other charges in history. The charge photo. I won't go into this in detail. I've given a public lecture on it in the past. Uh, if you want to buy my reasonably priced book on the light horse. <laughs> uh, there's an entire appendix devoted to this, uh, although I did note that it came out again today in an article by Paul Daly in The Guardian, uh, where he mentions some academics, by which I, I assume he means me, uh, have taken issue with the supposed authenticity of the charge. Uh, so I'll just sum it up and say there's no way in the world this is a photo of the charge of Bathsheba, in my view. Um, if anybody wants to argue about it, about it feel free to come up afterwards uh, and we can have a good long argument. And this one is, is, is coming out more and more and more. Uh, and uh, look, I'm not going to, I'm not a, I'm a historian, not a contemporist. I'm not going to get into the nuts and bolts of modern Australian politics, modern Australian international relations. But I think it's pretty fair to observe that this is an idea that is being pushed by politics and vested interests. Clearly, there are, the Australian government, for various reasons, is trying to build its ties with Israel and vice versa. And Beersheba is becoming, by and large, the vehicle by which this is done to a large extent. At the moment, you've got a whole bunch of Australians over there to conduct a reenactment. The Prime Minister is there uh, to do some more glad handing with Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, Bill Shorten is also there. Uh, and so this is an idea, I think you have to draw a pretty long bow to say that Australia somehow has a, a, hand, a role in the creation of the State of Israel. Uh, yeah, okay, Australia was part of a British force, uh, which was and a British empire, which helped set the conditions, which ultimately might have led to the creation of Israel 30 odd years down the road. But to draw links between the Australian involvement at Beersheba uh, 
and what happens in, 19, in the aftermath of the Second World War seems a rather long bow to me. Okay, so uh, Joan will be pleased to know that I'm about to conclude and we can move on to some questions. Look, what I've said here is not meant to diminish in any way what the Australians did at Beersheba. It is a remarkable feat of arms and the charge deserves some of the notoriety that it has. Uh, but there needs to be some pretty big caveats applied to that. This is not an Australian victory beyond the tactical sense of what uh, the Australian units engaged at Beersheba did. Yes, they won their respective fights, but broadly speaking, this is a British victory in which Australians played a significant but by no means dominant part. It is worth remembering that the Battle of Beersheba is an op operation conducted by two corps of the EEF. 20 Corps takes a lot of the load on the day and indeed it takes the casualties. And of course, this is just one part of the bigger third battle of Gaza. Uh, which, of course, in its turn, is just one part of a three-year campaign. Uh, so the Australian contribution, as you know, as amazing as it was from a from a storytelling point, viewpoint, and indeed in, you know, the achievement on, in a tactical sense, needs to be kept in perspective and given a little bit of context. Um, the Australian involvement is just one part of a vast, multi-layered history uh, to deal with a war which was an epochal and devastating war. Uh, and to extract Beersheba from that is some sort of defining moment, I think, is to invest a small, if reasonably significant, tactical action with far too much. Thank you, Joan. Well, I'm sure you'll all agree with me that that was an absolute tour de force, Sean. And uh, I know, having tr tried to summarise this campaign from my own writing, how immensely complex and difficult it is to understand. Um, and you made it <laughs> extremely comprehensible. I was particularly interested myself in, in the last uh, point about the, fa uh, the role of the campaign or the action in the foundation of Israel. There's a, an emerging literature now about what's called memorial diplomacy that is politicians across the world using the anniversaries of famous battles as essentially the stage to enhance bilateral or multilateral relations. And this seems to be a, a good example of, as we speak. Yeah, and, and I mean, to, to, be, to be fair to Bathsheba, it's not the first mm -hmm. time we've seen this. I mean, Paul Keating kneeling at Kokoda or John Howard talking about Gallipoli or something else is mm -hmm. the, Hardly alone, and, and successive anniversaries of D-Day perform this function in, yes, um, in Europe. But I know you all have questions, and I think we have about 25 minutes, I think, or seven. Yes, so, thank you. thank you. You look after the questions? Yeah, sure. Uh, Ali Kazar, uh, you mentioned the link between the, 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 the Battle of Kershiba and the establishment of Israel, and your last comments. Now, few uh, points. Uh, needed to be mentioned here, which are very important. Uh, the, uh, the fact that the Arabs and the Palestinians fought beside the Allies against the Ottoman Turkey, and that's nothing being mentioned, not uh, 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 you know, no acknowledgement of the Arab role. <coughs> uh, in the defeat of the Ottoman and the win winning of the uh, uh, Allies is mentioned anyway, and that's that's appalling. The second thing is that 1917, there was not one single Jew living in Beersheba. It was all Palestinians, um, and Beersheba was part of the. Palestinian state in accordance to the United Nations Partition Resolution of Palestine, which Australia played a major role to impose upon us. Um, the results of all this is the dispossession of the Palestinian people. Now there is, they, dispo, they ethnically cleanse the is it Zionist, uh, okay, I, I will conclude. The Zionist terrorist groups, they completely ethnically cleansed 
the entire population of, of Beersheba, who are now living in miserable conditions in refugee camps for the last 70 years in Gaza, in Gaza few kilometers away from their homes and properties. Um, now, for us as Arabs and Palestinians to see that there is, you know, complete cover-up, not one single mention of all this, is appalling. Well, uh, uh, I, I won't comment on the, on the partition of Israel. I, I, I could, but that's not really what I'm here to talk about tonight. Uh, you're quite right. I mean, the, there is a Arab involvement in this campaign. I didn't mention it tonight because it's not particularly relevant to the Battle of Beersheba. They become much more important in 1918. Their, their contribution, the, the, the Battle of Beersheba, wouldn't have won. Well, if the Palestinian population were against the Allies, they wouldn't have been, you know, sort of uh, victory. Well, you, may, you must admit that the the. The role of the Arabs becomes much more important in 1918. As the campaign advances northwards, it links up with the Hejaz uprising and uh, other Arabs that are living to the east of the Jordan River. Um, there certainly are there. I mean, I've been to Beersheba, uh, and you're right, there are no Arabs in Beersheba anymore. But as I said, I'd rather not comment about that because it's, it's not really what I'm here to talk about tonight. Uh, in broader terms, you're quite right, the fact that Arabs are involved in the campaign on the British side should probably be getting a lot more traction than it is. And as you're right, at the moment of the Bathsheba stuff, it doesn't factor it in at all. Whether it will factor in in commemorations next year might be interesting to see. Thank you, sir, for a very insightful presentation. And my question is not so much political or historical, it's more to do with equipment. So um, most modern troops and reservists even they train with light flares, so you either use night vision goggles or you use um, light flares so that one guy throws a night flare up and then you shoot the target. So I was wondering, after Beersheba, which officer or who in logistics sort of thought, oh, they couldn't see, we should get something like light flares? Or uh, well, there's certainly illumination flares in the First World War. Uh, nobody, if you're talking about in the charge, well, it is still light, but the light is going. Uh, Nobody seemed to have think to fire any illumination at that time. The horse artillery batteries, which are mostly providing the artillery support, uh, don't carry a lot of ammunition with them because they're mobile. Was it 20 years after that battle that someone invented it? No, no, the illumination flares are being used on the Western Front and other places in the First World War, so... Yeah, I, I came a bit confused about some of the things you said midway. When you referred to the light source of that cavalry. I mean, my initial my question was, and Mishi's asking, you know, why did why did Australia have a light horse tradition and not a cavalry tradition of carrying sabre and lance? That was my, my initial question. Uh, there, there is, there had been sort of more traditional cavalry in the pre-federation forces, if you like. Uh, after federation, the decision is taken to uniformly equip everybody as mounted rifles, uh, and mounted rifles are conceived of essentially as a type of abbreviated cavalry. And the reason why they're not equipped with the sword is that it's thought too difficult to train non-regular troops in the use of what's called the, at the time the arm blanche, the white arm, meaning swords or lances. There is a bit of a vague notion. For example, the first Australian military regulations that are created after Federation is this idea that in wartime they might be equipped with such a weapon, but that kind of disappears by around about 1907, 1908. Uh, Australians aren't alone in that thinking. The, 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 the New Zealanders are affected by the same thing. South African mounted rifle troops are affected by the same thing. In Britain, the yeomanry are as well, but they benefit from a decision taken not long before the war breaks out that if they get mobilised, they'll be equipped with the sword. So the Australians use the same training manuals and doctrine that the British yeomanry do, uh, the New Zealand mounted rifles do. In fact, the, the, the manual is called Yeomanry and Mounted Rifle Training 1912. Uh, as I said, they're, they're created and organised to carry out a cavalry role. They're meant to do all the things that cavalry do, with the exception of charging with a sword or lance. My last question would be, do you see there's a deficiency in this, uh, these circumstances? Well, that was the view that they came to in the Middle East. Yeah. Uh, by 1918, as I said, Hodgson is pushing for equipment with the sword. In 1917, he gets knocked back. He tries again in early 1918 and gets knocked back. 
but after some, some mounted actions that occur in the middle of 1918, he gets permission. And the Australian mounted... Now, not all the Light Horse do this. The Light Horse in the Anzac Mounted Division never convert or never adopt the sword, but the Light Horse regiments in the Australian Mounted Division do, and they f do undertake the advance to Damascus as full sword-carrying cavalry. You mentioned that um, the machine gun on the left flank is taken out by yep. artillery. Uh, I presume there were machine guns in the trenches that they were charging. Um, was it that it was getting darker and so that therefore they, the machine guns found it hard to draw a bead? Because normally you would think a machine gun, if they're in place, would have made it very difficult for the charge to be successful. It's difficult to know exactly whether they had machine guns. I'll be honest, I could not give you a definitive answer. I've never read anywhere that there are machine guns in the positions that they're actually charging on. There are certainly ones on the flank and that one on the wadi that they knock out. There's certainly plenty of riflemen and they're certainly supported by artillery. But whether there's actually any machine guns... It, it, now, for any machine gun charging, it's, they're employing frontal fire, which is not the best way to employ a machine gun. If you want to kill someone, use enfilade fire. Um, but what generally happens in this charge, and in pretty much in any charge in history that's successful, is that when you've got 800 blokes charging at you and they're getting closer and closer and closer, the aim starts to get a bit wonky. Uh, and you, you, so and it's not to say they panicked, but their ability to uh, adapt to the circumstance, the closer the, like the charge got, likely the worse their shooting got. That said, uh, people poo-poo this, but it's quite true. In the First World War, most rifle bullets wouldn't kill a horse straight out. Um, and in fact, this is one of the arguments against adopting, adopting small calibre bullets in the lead up to the war, is that it won't stop a horse. Uh, if you want to stop a horse, you need a big, solid bullet. Um, and unless you shoot it in the head or get a lucky shot into the heart, the horse will keep going, probably, and then it'll stop, and then it'll fall over. Uh, so even, and also, sorry, this is this is all bringing out PhD stuff for me now. I can I can bang on about this for hours. Uh, the the other thing as well is, of course, that when riflemen shoot at charging horse, horsemen, they aim at the horses. They don't aim at the men. The men are the one who are going to do them the damage. Uh, there's 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 claims that you know the Ottomans didn't adjust their sights and things. I actually don't recall ever seeing those claims in the original documents. I have my suspicions that that's a bit of a myth that comes in somewhere along the way. At any count, that doesn't account for the artillery. Anyone who's ever looked at a gun knows that guns depressed below zero degrees. Um, they might have got inside the fuse settings, but not under the guns. So, yeah, that, does that answer you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, probably, I probably over answered it. What were the actual casualties amongst the Australians in the charge? Oh, in the charge, it was about, it was, I think it was 31 killed, or 30-ish killed. Most of that uh, actually die in the, in the fighting in the trenches, not during the charge itself. So there aren't many men who are killed during the charge. It's mostly once they get onto the position and they dismount and they do the... And that's the thing that comes out. The, it's, it's partly Beersheba, but also... By 1918, they're making the observation in the Desert Mounted Corps that if you can do a mounted attack, always do a mounted attack before you think about dismounting and doing it on foot, because your casualties will be lighter. Uh, they very rapidly come to the conclusion that mounted attacks actually are not costly things. I just wanted to add on to that. Um, the Ottomans, prior to Bashir, they used to be trained by from Moltke, and some papers say that uh, they never did what he instructed them to do. And leading up to a battle in Egypt, they actually lost because they never followed the German instructions, so it would be quite likely that they did not adjust the sides. Possibly. Could I ask myself, why do you think this campaign has been played such a large role in Australian memories of World War I? Because as you say, there are the two films. Uh, one, tell them about Chevelle making the film in World War II. <laughs> um, well, of course, you know, Harry, um, Charles Chevelle, who's Harry's nephew, he, he makes 40,000 horsemen in 1940. Uh, the thing with, it, with this is the campaign actually, I think, has very little resonance in the broader memory. What, what matters is Beersheba. I think if you walked up to somebody in the street and said Beersheba, 
you might get some a, glint, a, a, a glimmer of recognition, but that again, again depends on who you're asking and where you're asking and that kind of thing. Uh, to echo a story you once told me, Joan, I was in Melbourne on Friday going to the Shrine of Remembrance and I jumped in a taxi and I said, please take me to the Shrine of Remembrance. And he looked at me and said, what's that? Uh, so you know, Australia's military history is not for everybody. Uh, and I had to Google and show him a picture of it. Once I showed him the picture, he knew where he was going. Uh, and, I, and, and when I was speaking there, I made the observation that really everything about Bathsheba in, in Australia was kind of in... Sorry, the Palestine campaign is kind of encapsulated in Beersheba. This has come to represent what the Palestine campaign was about. There's nothing in here... If you walked up to someone in the street and said Romani, you probably wouldn't get any reckoning, or Megiddo, or the Yaman raid, or any other number of actions that the Australians are involved in. You, you, I'd be surprised if you got much recognition from apart from a very few people. Uh, so Beersheba, I think, has just become this all-encompassing thing and, and it really, even that is just reduced to the charge. You know, the charge is set up as an example of Australian daring do. It's supposedly a way of illuminating Australian, supposed Australian traits. And, but as I said at the beginning, I think really the reason why it's got so popular, I suspect it has a lot to do with the films. Uh, I've always had it in the back of my head that one day I'll do an article on why Bishiba got famous, you know, how a battle becomes famous and some don't. And I think it's really, in Australia, it's, a lot of it is down to the two murders, <coughs> particularly the 1941, uh, the 1987 one, different period, different time. It kind of probably refreshed things a little bit, but I think the 1941 is really the one that sets out. Um, and, of course, that's filmed during the middle of the... Se well, not the beginning, the early part of the Second World War. If, if, you know, if you look at the, the baddies in that flick, they're very Germanic baddies, the Ottomans <laughs> are. Um, even though they're charging Bathsheba, it's all about what the evil fiendish Huns are doing to them and <laughs> manipulating the Ottomans and all the rest of it. Uh, and I guess in the wartime context as, context as well, and in an age when going to the cinema was a big thing, 40,000 horsemen just sort of put an imprint if you like, which is still with us today, I think. Mm. Oh. Oh, we'll take this last question, I think. Thank you. Jean, we're making um, speculation about what ifs with military battles is always... Well, always a dangerous thing to do, but yeah. But to give a sense of the logistic stretch of the Australians at the time of, of the end of the day, if, if the charge you know, hadn't been made, yep. and, and also stepping into the myth territory, um, how stretched were the Australians? So I always sort of said, if they hadn't got the wells, Australia would be prepared. The forces, the British forces, really would have been in difficulty. What, what's your view of that? Uh, well, from from the mount, the water is really important to the mounted troops because horses can only go so long without water. I mean, people talk about the whalers and their fantastic endurance in, the, in this campaign. There's a as much as there's a fair bit of mythologising about the light, the light horsemen, there's also a lot of mythologising about the whalers. Uh, so certainly if they hadn't captured Bathsheba by the end of the day, the mounted troops would have had some problems. Uh, they'd been a bit lucky in that there had been some rainfall in the days leading up to it, so during the advance on Bathsheba they were actually able to gather up, you know, get water their horses and pools of water and puddles and things. Uh, but certainly if they hadn't captured Bathsheba, the mounted troops would have been in a bit of, bit of a pickle and they would have had to withdraw... Uh, during the night, presumably, to get back to the water sources, which were, were quite a way to the west. Uh, in terms of the, the broader plan, uh, certainly Allenby's conception of what the Third Battle of Gaza would, should be like uh, would have pretty much faltered on day one. Uh, that said, getting into what ifs, Allenby would have prevailed sooner or later. Um, he would have had to shift his planning, but the reality is, in October 19. 1917, he has the preponderance of troops. He has a much stronger logistics tail behind him. Uh, he has a very well-trained army by this stage. It's been, he's really recrafted the EEF. It's got very quite high morale. Um, the Ottomans have got lots of problems when it comes to fighting. They're quite good on the, they're quite good defensive fighters, but they've got fundamental sustainment issues, which are always going to make it more difficult for them. So Allenby would have won it would just would have looked different. And it might have been a month or so down the road, but I don't think that ultimately I don't think the decision in southern Palestine was in much doubt. OK. Perhaps just in conclusion, I might say that Jean and I were privileged to be taken to be a Sheba 
10 years ago, wasn't it? And uh, one of the most striking things about what I might call the memorial landscape is this huge new park called Anzac Park, which I think has been funded by the Pratt Foundation, and it makes General Allenby's statue look absolutely minuscule, doesn't it, in contrast? Yeah, there's a, so, there's a, there's a small bust of Allenby and, a, and an enormous bronze light horseman. <laughs> And this, and this huge park in a new area of Beersheba, so it's part of the promotion of our memory of that camp, or that particular action in that big campaign. But as I said, I think we, we were privileged to hear from Jean tonight because he really is, is Australia's authority on this subject. So thank you very much for a wonderful introduction to this. <laughs>